We were going to get started here in just one more minute, uh, but it sounds like everyone's here, everyone's paying attention, so uh, if I can just, I'm going to ask my friends from PCTV if we're, if we're good to go. If you need a minute, you just let me know. We're good? We're good. Um, well, good evening, and welcome to the 2019 Vote School Board First Candidate Forum. Uh, you, guys, you guys excited for this, for this debate, this candidate forum tonight? All right. Uh, my name is James Fogarty, and I have the distinct honor of working with a talented team of staff, board members, parents, students, and educators at A-plus schools. Um, first, I want to thank the other members of the school, Vote School Board First Coalition, who support tens of thousands of families, youth, and educators across our region, and who share our commitment to equity in the work they do. They've joined in this call to action to prioritize these elections because the future of 23,186 children are in the hands of current and future board members. The coalition members are All for All, A-Post, Arise, BPEP, Circles of Greater Pittsburgh, the Latino Community Center, Lawrenceville United, PEP Rally, League of Women Voters, the Pittsburgh Project, the Pittsburgh Promise, the Jewish Federation of Greater Pittsburgh, Repair the World, Trying Together, Be There in the United Way of Southwestern Pennsylvania, Youth Places, the Office of Child Development at the University of Pittsburgh and the Pride Project, Pump, the Urban League of Greater Pittsburgh, and the Urban League Young Professionals. Can we give a hand to the coalition members for all they're doing? Thank you. I want to give special thanks to the Jewish Federation of Greater Pittsburgh, PUMP, and the League of Women Voters for their financial and technical support tonight. Um, thanks also to PCTV21 for partnering with us so we're able to live stream this event on Facebook uh, in both English and Spanish. Um, and they will be able to rebroadcast it on their station multiple times prior to the election. And thank you to Terry Kennedy, Linda Wren, Cindy, Cindy Falls. Did Ms. Wilson walk in? She was registered. We hope to see her. Uh, and Tiffany Simino from the mayor's office for being here tonight. We appreciate you uh, taking part in this event as well. A couple of notes of housekeeping before we begin. You got a note card on your way in. Please begin to think of your questions uh, for the candidates. When our moderators make an announcement, and they will make an announcement, um, we will have volunteers go around and collect the cards. Um, the League of Women Voters will do what they do, which is then sort the cards, theme them, and then provide questions back to our, uh, to our moderators so that questions can be asked. Um, also, if you need Spanish translation, we have headsets in the lobby for you. Si necesitan traducción en español, tenemos auriculares para ayudarlos. Without any further ado, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce our Team Block student moderators for this evening's event. First, Leon Blair, a Brashear senior, student body president, and future Robert Morris University student. Let's give him a big hand. <laughs> Michelle Bethel, an Aldernice junior. And, and Dominic Victoria, an, an Obama junior. And we want to acknowledge that we had a fourth moderator, Giovanni Castaño from Brashear, who was going to join us tonight from the Latino Community Center's youth program, but was unable to participate due to an injury he sustained last night. Now I'll turn it over to Leon, who's going to get this thing started. Leon. Hello. Thank you. So good evening, everyone. And welcome to the 2019 Vote School Board First Candidate Forum. So I want to say thank you to all our candidates for coming out, and thanks to our audience for coming out as well to hear from our school board candidates. So get a round of applause for yourselves. <laughs> so before I introduce you to all our candidates who are here tonight, let's go over a few ground rules. So thank you to the League of Women Voters for keeping time tonight. They're going to be our timekeepers and holding up the signs to let them know when to stop talking, when to start, and how much time they have left. <laughs> So when you see a yellow card, it means you guys have 15 seconds left. And when you see a red card, that means your time is up. I don't want to have to cut you adults off, so just, you know. <laughs> so our hope is that this will be a civil and respectful discussion focused on the issues facing Pittsburgh Public Schools. We ask that audience members please warmly welcome the candidates when we introduce them, but please save all applause for the conclusion of the event. We have a lot of candidates up here, and we want to make sure we get through as many questions as possible. You all should have received a note card when you walked in, so for you guys to write down questions for the candidates. As James mentioned, 
we will make an announcement shortly to collect your cards. When we do, please just hold up your card and we'll come around and select questions to ask the candidates. Now, for our candidates. So from District 2, we have David Atkinson. Y'all ain't gonna clap? Nokasari Griffin L. No Sakari. Chris Rice. Devin Terrafolo. From District 4, we have Anna Batista. And and Pam Harbin. From District 6, we have Heather Fulton. And Mr. William Gallagher. And that is all the candidates that we have here tonight. Now, M Michelle will ask the first question. This question is for all candidates. Why are you running for school board and what is your vision for the role of school directors? What is your vision for the role of school directors? And you all have a minute to, for your responses. Hello. <laughs> My name is Dr. Nosakari Griffinell. I decided to run for school board because I wanted to serve my community in a different way. Uh, over the last uh, three years, I was a stay-at-home dad. I wanted to give my children a solid foundation before they enter into public schools. In addition, I was a uh, reading buddy with the Carnegie Public Library. Just recently, I was named Advocate of the Year for my literacy work in the community, and I believe that if we are to change our community, we have to meet children at their dreams. That is my vision for school board, to create structures that help students maximize their human potential while at the same time pursuing their dreams. Thank you. Good evening. My name is David Atkinson, and I'm running for school board, District 2, Pittsburgh. I'd like to thank this, the sponsors of the event for hosting the event, as well as our student moderators, as well as the other candidates for being here. I'm running for school board for a couple of reasons. First of all, like all of us, I'm sure we want to see great schools in Pittsburgh that serve students, families, and the city well. Uh, for me personally, um, I was a student who had um, some struggles as an early student, and I had an influential teacher who took me from suspensions and detentions to A's and B's. So I want all children to have the same opportunity that I had. I would say just quickly that um, I want to see inclusive schools where all children have high quality math and science programs and we especially get underrepresented groups into science, technology, engineering and math or areas. And I'd like to see the district position for pre-K with developmentally appropriate practices through third grade. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Kirk Rise. I'm also in District 2. Uh, I'm running, I mean, minimally, I, I am a father, I'm a resident and a taxpayer. I, I am specifically running because I care about the long-term future of our city and its residents. I think there's too many neighborhoods that are overlooked uh, and, and aren't, giving, aren't being given an opportunity where their students aren't being given a fair opportunity. And I also believe the working class are being priced out of the neighborhoods and, and, and that school districts have something to do with that. I, I think residents without an education become marginalized in our society, and, and, and our society itself doesn't appreciate or reach its full potential. Recognizing that um, people don't really appreciate the district to their own peril, and recognizing that people don't understand the role of the board, I, I would like to come in here and, and add my skills uh, to, to help these, address these problems. Uh, good evening, my name is Devin Telefero and I am a resident in the north side of Pittsburgh in East Allegheny. I'm a Pittsburgh native and a product of a failed public school system. 
And so my mission um, in my role of um, embarking on school board director is to ensure that the voice of the students are heard and that the needs are met so that our students can be as successful as they possibly can in the future because they are our future and they are going to be our future doctors, lawyers, politicians, community leaders and if we invest in them now and make decisions for their future now then we are doing us, ourselves a service. Hello. Hi, my name's Anna Batista. I am running for school board because I'm a parent to public school students, because I'm a lifelong progressive that believes in a strong public sector, and because I have expertise in public policy and how to create and enact it to achieve the goals of our community. Now, I'm a product of a low-income, diverse public school, and I had a great education and experience. As a parent, I want my kids to have a great public school experience. As a progressive, I want every kid in every neighborhood in Pittsburgh to have access to a great public school option. I want to use my expertise in public policy to solve our biggest issues. Right now, we have kids, nearly half, who cannot read at grade level by third grade. That has to change. Our role as school board director is to get at the root of huge issues like that, to ask questions, to look at the evidence, to get input from the community, and to create solutions that are gonna help our kids succeed. Hi, I'm Pam Harbin, and I'm running for school board in District 4. I have been here every year, but I've been on that side, not this side. Um, I've been on that side as a parent, as an advocate and as a community organizer. And every year when I watch this event, we talk about the same things. We talk about equity. We talk about our students that have barriers and have obstacles to doing their best. And the one thing that has been clear to me is that we have not used the community wisdom that we have down there to make decisions that happen up here. So as a school board director, my vision is to use the parents, the students, the teachers, the people that are in our classrooms and in our communities every day to inform the policies and the practices that come into our school buildings and into our classrooms for our students. Hi, I'm Heather Fulton and I'm running for District 6. The reason I'm running for school board is because I have two twin daughters who are in 11th grade at Alderdice. They have had an amazing education in the district. They have had some of the most phenomenal teachers. And now that they're in 11th grade and they're gonna be leaving the district, I feel it's my time to give back what I have gotten in the last 11, 12 years. My vision for the district is that we need to make the district the best it can possibly be. We need to make sure that the students' voices are heard. We need to make sure that our early education is at its top. We need to start promoting the good in our school. Do you hear, when you hear Pittsburgh Public Schools, people say not always the nicest and kindest things. People don't understand the good things that the graduates we have coming from our schools, going to Ivy League schools, and the incredible programs we have. And my vision is to make sure that everybody knows how good Pittsburgh Public Schools is. Good evening, everyone. My name is Gallagher. I am running for District 6 School Board Director. I have a vision that Pittsburgh Public Schools should be a world-class school district. I have 27 years experience teaching in a school district. Three of my wonderful children are Pittsburgh Public School graduates. And the coolest thing was that I walked in uh, this evening, one of my ex-students is out front taking the names. She's politically involved in doing wonderful volunteer work. Our schools can be phenomenal. But what we need is direction. As a school board director, we, are, we make policy, we follow up, and we make sure people are doing the right job. Uh, the great, uh, great public schools did a 175-page study on our school district. We have all the information, and right now it's really not being used. We need to follow up. We have to hold central administration responsible. Thank you. Thank you for your answers, and Don will come up with the next question. Uh, this question is for the candidates from District 2. 
Um, all four, four of you mentioned in your responses in the Vote School Board First candidate questionnaire that you want to improve the district's strategy to engage with families and the community at large. What exactly will you do in your role as a school board member to strengthen the bond between the district and the families and communities served by PBS? Uh, you'll have 90 seconds to respond to the question. I'll start. Um, so I'm a really big advocate for community engagement. I do that in my job every day, and I believe that the, the role of the community is a part, is being able to play a part in raising up our young people and making sure that they're successful. Um, as family members, they are responsible for these children, um, but we as community members and leaders, business owners, um, and residents are also responsible for their success. So I believe that bridging those, um, those entities together um, by hope, open forums as a school board representative, being public, being out in the community, being able to engage with the families, to hear the needs, to know what's going on, so that we can all work together to create a better public school system for our children. Good evening. Um, my thoughts with regard to engaging with families, first of all, recognizing that the role of the board in, in, in our formal board capacity, I mean, we can promote policies within the board, we, within the district, that will, will lead to further community engagement. I, I would like to see greater community engagement through uh, the expansion of the community schools. I'd like to see greater access, uh, accessibility to the schools. I'd like to see much more accessibility to the information that's uh, in, within the schools. And I would also like to see an elimination of a lot of the barriers, particularly the barriers that exist in, uh, for families that come from low-income uh, low neighborhoods. People that might not have a computer or access to scanners or other different things that, that might be necessary to, 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 to apply for schools or, or to research magnet schools to, do, uh, to, to, to participate within the community. So I believe that in order to make, to engage the community, you have to, number one, have trust in the community. You have to build relationships with parents. You have to build relationships with community members. This is the work that I've been doing with the library. Uh, this is the work I've been doing in the community for the last year and a half. So you have to take what I would call an ethnographic approach, which is an academic term for embedding oneself in the community, listening to the voices of the community, documenting their voices, and figuring out ways in which to develop policy uh, through, uh, through uh, the community's uh, voices or through the board. So I believe that if we are to engage the community, it's about listening, documenting, and creating policy that meet the community at their social, academic, and academic needs and at their dreams. If we don't meet communities at their dreams, then all we're doing is working for them. My candidacy is a candidacy that's talking about democratizing the policymaking process, meaning that we need to have people at the center of our policy, not on the periphery. Thank you. Thank you for that question. Um, there are some existing channels that engage families at the district. We can build on those, like our monthly parent um, meeting. Uh, but we know that parents are also busy, and they may not be able to attend a monthly meeting, right? So we need to utilize new tools, like online tools, more frequent online surveys, uh, virtual ways of engaging parents that may not have been available before. I think it's important to also understand that we have students and families coming from a variety of backgrounds. We have students with different disabilities. They look different. They were born in different places. Uh, they may practice different religions. Um, and they may have, um, families may have students who are LGBT or Q. We have to understand the needs of those families, address the needs of those families, and authentically listen to them. I want our district to be a safe and welcoming place for families and students of all backgrounds. I promise to listen, to learn, and to evaluate uh, the needs of parents as I move towards this role as school board director. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the answers. I'll pass it back to Leon for the next question. Uh, 
All right, so this question is specifically for District, two, uh, district 4 uh, candidates. So in your responses to the candidate questionnaire, both of you talked about the need for, for the district to hire and retain diverse teaching candidates. How will you support the ongoing efforts in PPS and what changes will you advocate for at the board level to ensure that we are attracting high quality di diverse group that wants to teach in PPS? And you each will have a minute and a half to answer that question. Hi, okay. Um, so the question is about attracting and retaining teachers, is that right? Yeah. Diverse. Diverse teachers, yeah. So well, part of the superintendent's strategic plan is to reach out to more diverse universities, historically black colleges and universities, uh, colleges and universities from more diverse places than uh, Southwestern PA. That strategy should be continued and strengthened for sure. Um, one thing that can be a challenge is that Pittsburgh and Philadelphia are held to a, um, a, a, a priority list of hiring um, that can give priority to, to uh, teachers uh, based on different factors, and that can actually limit um, the ability to hire teachers from outside the area who might be more diverse. And so that's one thing that, that has to be changed at the state level. So working with our legislators, working with the governor to see if that's possible for Pittsburgh to give us more freedom to hire more, a more diverse workforce. We should also continue our efforts to uh, home grow as many teachers from Pittsburgh public schools as we can, because there's no one who, does, who understands the school district better, or is more at home here, uh, and could connect with the students better than graduates of PPS. Um, so continuing the CTE programs there, um, continuing ways, making sure that we're keeping in touch with those students as they leave here. Um, once we have them, let's make sure that the teachers in the most challenging areas are, are getting compensated fairly and that they are, um, we give them incentives to stay in the most challenging places and serve subjects. That's a really good question. Um, I have two boys in Pittsburgh Public Schools, one in 10th grade at Alderdice and one in 8th grade at Side Tech. And neither of them have a black teacher, neither of them have a gay teacher. Um, I think it's really important that our students have teachers that reflect their unique identities, whatever they are. And um, the best way to do that is to have a teaching workforce that we value and retain. And right now, I don't believe our teachers feel valued and we keep losing teachers um, when we don't respect them and treat them as professionals. So I think that's one of the first things that we need to do. Um, the need to grow your own is definitely important. I believe we could do a grow your own program in collaboration with one of the universities, maybe with one of the HBCUs where we can grow our own, not only at Brashear, and now there's a new program being added at UPREP for um, early childhood education, but maybe we have a grow your own program where we could have substitute teachers come through that program and get some experience as substitutes. Thank you. Michelle Wax, the next question. Um, this question is for District 6. Both of you identified improving early childhood literacy rates as a priority for the district. What policies will you advocate for on the school board that have been proven to improve early childhood literacy rates? Sorry, what, was the last part? what policies will you advocate for on the school board that have been proven to improve early childhood literacy rates? Well, I think we can all agree that early childhood education is extremely important. I think one of the best things we need to do is we have a good program and a good system in the starts. One of our biggest issues is that a lot of people in the community are unaware of how many programs we have for pre-K. We need to make sure that all community members are aware of that Pittsburgh Public Schools actually has pre-K. There was a study done in one of the local communities and not everybody understood that we actually have this program. We need to have more. There is already over 90 child care pre-K centers available and there's still so many people that need it and we just have to have more pre-K and we have to make sure that everybody is aware that we do have it.
Great question. Thank you for it. Um, first of all, the model we should all go to throughout the city is the community learning centers. Our, we have beautiful schools that close. We, we should be utilizing this. We should be partnering with Head Start. We should be partnering with any available agency that will help us with this. Many children come into our, um, our, our schools with what they call like the, the million word deficit, okay, because they don't get reading at home. We also have to teach our parents that you have to read your children at home, okay? Reading has to be something that you love. You can't get a kid into school and start pounding them with, you got to read so you get a job. Reading has to be something you develop and you love. And the literacy program, once we're in school, needs to be refined. We have schools that we, we mentioned 75% of the kids are reading below level. Why are we not having almost like a SWAT team attack with teachers in these schools? Why are these kindergarten first graders in a classroom with 19 with reading deficits? Why aren't these split in half? And this is, could have been something that could have been done a long time ago and it's been neglected. We have to get the sense of urgency that this must be done. And that is our job as school directors to hold the curriculum people accountable, to hold human resources accountable. Thank you. Um, Don will come up with the next question. Uh, so this question is uh, for every candidate, uh, and you'll have a minute to respond. Pittsburgh Public Schools is currently facing a budgetary shortfall forecast over the next several years that will mean spending down a reserve fund. Several of you on the stage have talked about the need for more people to be hired in our schools. How will you ensure that students have the supports they need to succeed while also maintaining the long-term financial health of the district? Are there areas of the budget you're in favor of cutting and or are you in favor of raising taxes? Again, you have one minute to answer the question. So the district has a number of challenges, um, including enrollment challenges and demographic cha challenges in the change in city. And um, we have some schools that are over-enrolled, some schools are under-enrolled. We know we have a budget deficit, um, which will result in using up our reserve fund by 2022. So within the next couple of years, we're gonna have to look at either, either raising taxes or finding another source of revenue, cutting expenses, or some uh, combination of those three options. We need a process that assesses changing enrollment and demographics and ensures our schools are meeting the needs of students, family, and the city. I've proposed an independent commission to assess current enrollment, demographic, and career trends to develop recommendations for the realignment of feeder patterns, school configuration, and programming with consideration given to underserved communities. I would also task the commission with pivoting the district to prepare for the eventual adoption of universal pre-kindergarten. The independent commission would consider sustainable sources of income to equitably distribute resources throughout the district. It's on my website. Thank you. So I just want to start off by saying uh, a budget is a moral document. It shows us where, what we value and who we value. One of the common threads that we keep on engaging in is cutting programs, cutting budgets, and it's always on the backs of the poor. So what I would do as a school board member is critically evaluate each line item and figure out ways to be innovative, to uh, solicit funds from foundations, figure out ways in which to uh, create new revenue streams. But one of the things I will not do is stand for us balancing our budgets on the backs of the poor when we have sports teams that can pay athletes millions of dollars or nonprofit organizations don't, that don't pay their fair share in taxes. We need to figure out ways in which to solicit funds in peaceful ways and in raising taxes. Thank you. I uh, recently read an article about the I Promise School in Akron. It was funded in large part, it's a public school, but it's funded in large part by uh, the LeBron James Foundation. And they noted that a number of things that were making that program a success were the, the, were the programs and policies and practices they were able to put in place, and they said none of these were like a secret sauce. It was the fact that they were had, they were typically budget constrained, but 
with the addition of these foundation dollars, they were able to meet a lot more of their needs and get past these. So you're right. I mean, we're facing some significant budget constraints. I, I, I think we're going to have to look at doing more with what we have. We really have to scrutinize the budget. Um, I mean, we've, we've already, like over the last five years, our enrollment's gone down by 10%. We've added, however, uh, 132 teachers, 40 some administrators, and in the last year, we've added $32.4 million budget. We really need to do a better job of making sure our resources are allocated efficiently. Um, so I think when we, well, when I think about this question of, you know, budget and cutting budget, you know, as a taxpayer, do I do not want my taxes to increase, and I know that you all in the seats don't want that either. So it, I think first of collaboration. So collaboration is a powerful tool that we may underutilize in the school district. We live in a city with a premier number of in, uh, higher education institutions. Could we not be building more partnerships with the University of Pittsburgh, with the CMUs or the Duquesnes? Could we not be forging more partnerships with nonprofit agencies to provide the services so that we don't necessarily have to hire the support systems that exist, but that we are collaborating and partnering with what already exists? And I think the last thing that, I, that comes to my mind is, is making sure that we utilize our community members and our community resources because we are a part of making the difference. Thank you. No problem. Uh, I think that the, the future of the progressive movement involves efficient and effective government. We have to show that we can use our taxpayer dollars as intelligently as possible so that more people are willing to invest in our public institutions. So I want to take a look at that budget, at the line items, and take a look at every dollar that is not being spent in the classroom or for our schools, in the guidance counselor offices, places where students need them, and question if it's doing its job there. And if not, then we need to redirect that so that every dollar possible is going to the students to learn to do better and to thrive. Uh, I work professionally helping public sector agency make decisions about their multi-billion dollar budgets. Draw the line from what they're doing on the ground, is it achieving their goal, asking those questions and seeing the best outcomes possible. I agree with no Sakari. We cannot continue to but balance our budgets on the backs of our families, our working families. We just can't keep asking parents to come into our schools that don't have the basic things that we need. We need smaller class sizes because we know that that works. We need our counselors. We need our social workers. We did not have a nurse in every school until last year. Imagine that. Nobody wants to send their kid to these schools. So what we need to do is we need to look at where we can find the money. Cyber charter schools cost Pittsburgh Public Schools $13 million a year. There is not one cyber school that outperforms a Pittsburgh Public School. Um, we have 932 students that go to cyber charter schools and it costs them, four, it, we send $14,000 per student to a school that doesn't even have a building. Um, UPMC, you can pay your fair share, as far as I'm concerned. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> I agree with that. We can't keep having our budget the way it is. We need to figure out the best way to utilize every dollar that is being spent. We can't keep asking the parents and the community members to raise our taxes when we have so much money and we have to make sure that what we do have is being spent at the best possible rate. Um, we have think we shouldn't cut the teachers, we shouldn't cut salaries, but we have to figure out how we do it. What do we have that we own and we have that we're not using? Do we have real estate that we can get rid of, that we can sell to make more money? What do we have on all of our budgets that is just unnecessary that we could get rid of and we could utilize to make up for that money that we have more to spend for the teachers and the students? Thank you. First of all, let's take a look at the budget. Okay, the budget 
isn't exactly what it appears to be, okay? There's a lot of money hidden in, in the background. It, it's, it's, a lot of times it's a scare tactic, okay? The, greater, uh, the great uh, public schools study, we do not spend our money very well towards academic goals. We just don't do that. We have a fiasco with our transportation department, okay, with the busing. We have underutilized buildings. We have so many problems that need, the board needs to oversee. I actually taught in classrooms with no textbooks. No textbooks, okay. I was responsible for developing my own lessons without a textbook. Kids don't have books to take home. How are you going to increase literacy and get kids college ready when they can't take a textbook home to read it? That's where our money should go. And the last thing is the board tabs, and Sorry, we'll address that later. I'll pass it on to Leon for the next question. So audience members, we're going to start collecting your questions now. So if you do have a question, please hold it up. And someone will be around to get it shortly. Also, um, we have a few more districts uh, specific questions, but once we do an all candidate question, we're going to start at that end, okay? So be ready. And while they collect those, I'm going to read the question. This question is specific for District 2 candidates. You guys are popular. All right, now. <laughs> so this question is specific for District 2 candidates. So. What will you do as a school board member to engage families with limited English proficiency? Specifically, what ways can we, can we make the work and actual meetings of the school board more inclusive and in welcoming those who may not speak English or have limited proficiency? And we're gonna start with David, is that okay? Thanks for that question. So the question was on um, inclusion for ESL families, correct? Yeah, specifically with the board, though. Specifically what? At, at the board level. At the board level. Um, so I've had the privilege of speaking to some ESL students one of, of one of our local schools. I work in IT, and so occasionally I'll go into schools and talk to students about careers in IT, and I was fortunate enough to have the opportunity to talk to some students who were born abroad um, and were ESL students about careers in IT. So I've heard some of their concerns and needs, and I think at the, um, at the board and policy level, we have to accommodate the needs of these families, um, and we have to utilize tools and provide the appropriate resources for ESL learners. Thank you. So when I lived in South Africa, I was a professor in South Africa for about three and a half years. And so I was an immigrant, and English was not the primary language when I went out into the communities to do work. So I think as board members, we need to have a deep level of empathy, number one. Uh, number two, I think that we need champions in these respective communities. Uh, these champions could be uh, students who are fluent in English, or they could be adults who are fluent in English who can help us better develop an understanding of the community. And more importantly, going back to what I said in the beginning, we have to sit down. I'll give you an example. When I did an internship some years ago at Shinley High School, I had a friend who was Somalian in high school. I was able to connect with the Somali students at Shinley High School based upon my general dialogues about what my friend experienced. So it's a deep level of empathy, number one. Number two, we have to have champions in these communities. And then number three, we have to be willing to sit down and engage with the community on their level. So that might mean eating food, going to events, just engaging in what I call this ethnographic embeddedness, being one with the people versus working for the people. That's how we better develop policies for people who are immigrants from a person who used to be an immigrant. Good evening. I, you know, research shows that boards have a direct uh, effect on, on, on student achievement. And yet, again, and I said it earlier, that most people don't really understand the importance of the board, and a significant number of people aren't even aware of its existence. So I think the most important thing that we need to do is communicate the existence of the board, make that available, sort of the entire structure, the, 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 the entire district, starting with the board, the administration, and the schools, 
and, and, and make sure that the information is shared, circulated, and particularly uh, available for, for families you know, with ESL. Uh, and, and then to the extent they're, they're willing and able to make it to the meetings, we, we, you know, we either have uh, you know, translators available live or, or even on the broadcasts, they can, have, you know, uh, they, they can have those available in their native languages too. I've had to utilize the district's translation services for one of the programs that I work with at Greenfield. And so I think making sure that we have um, the partnerships and the connections with people that can train and educate our teachers, our, um, our administrators, our service providers in the building to make sure that our schools are a welcoming place. Uh, for all of our kids, whether they are from the United States or from another country. And I know um, probably one of the most welcoming schools that I've experienced when it comes to international students is Brashear High School, where I spend also some time working um, with my mentoring program there as well. So I think, again, I keep emphasizing this because I think we don't tap in enough to the resources that already exist. One of the places that come to mind is Casa San Jose. They do a lot of great work working with our, our students, um, uh, Spanish-speaking students. And so, again, I think as board members, we need to make sure that we are educated ourselves so that we can better make decisions on behalf of all of the students throughout the district. Michelle will ask the next question. This question is specifically for District 4. You both talked about the need to strengthen our community schools model. What exactly needs strengthening, strengthening and what actions will you take as a board member to realize that vision of community schools? So the community schools model um, just came to Pittsburgh a couple years ago. And Cincinnati, it took them over 10 years to get it to work. I'm, on, I'm lucky enough to be on the community school steering committee at the district level where um, it's, it is great to know that we have the city, the county, Department of Human Services, uh, Department of Health, Pittsburgh Promise, foundations, the school district, the union, everybody at this table trying to make the community schools work. Fundamentally, what we need to make community schools work is to um, intentionally deepen authentic engagement with the community. Community schools, the model starts with identifying the strengths in the community and the needs in the community and putting those together to make sure that we are um, meeting the students' needs and the families' needs and bringing resources to the communities what, that need them. So I would advocate for the people at that community school's table to make a commitment to invest because right now nobody at that table, everybody's at that table um, invested in the work but not financially. So I would ask them to make a financial investment and we make that a priority in our district because we definitely need to make sure that we have community schools because there are children that need their needs met in every one of our schools and we've got to get that done. I think the first uh, and most important thing we need to do for our community schools initiative is to make sure that it's properly funded. Um, in the short term, that may mean finding foundations, short term funding uh, to strengthen it. Uh, but we need to make sure that we do find a long term solution to make sure that they're financially viable because we do not want a good idea or a good policy that uh, does not end up having the impact that we wanted because there wasn't the resources to make sure it succeeds. Um, good implementation of policies is hugely important and it is the hardest part. It's, it's one thing to have a good idea and then to roll it out. You need to make sure um, that it is going on the ground the way you anticipate. For community schools, let's always make sure that we're talking to the community members so that the services at each school are the ones that those members need, that the students need, that their families need. The whole idea of community schools is to provide the resources for the rest of a student's life so that they're not distracted by hunger, by the need for clothing, uh, by other issues going Going on. So making sure the resources they need match with, with each community uh, and then making sure that implementation is strong and that 
uh, families feel like they are being listened to, that they have access to these uh, institutions, and that our partners, the organizations who are there providing the services, have good functional relationships with the district. Thank you. And Dawn will come up with the next question. So this question is for the District 6 candidates, um, and you'll have a minute and a half to answer. Uh, you both spoke of the importance and the need to incorporate students' voice into district decision making. Are you in favor of creating specific policies to institutionalize student voice in district decision making, and what would that look like? The great thing about being a lifelong learner is that you can learn from anyone, and you would not believe the knowledge I have received from the youngsters today. It's phenomenal. It's phenomenal. We have an uh, advisory board to, the, uh, to the, the superintendent. I think it should be enhanced. Each school needs represented. I think we have to listen to kids. Kids teach us every I learn something every day. I'm, I'm a retired teacher, but I'm still coaching football down at w &J College. I learn a ton of stuff every day off the young men I coach. Last night, I had the pleasure of uh, my daughter, a Pittsburgh public school graduate from Kappa, did a documentary, she's going to be a documentarian, did a documentary in Pittsburgh, a city of bridges in a country of walls. And I learned so much off my daughter in her documentary about dealing with English language learners, dealing with the fear of documented migrants, undocumented migrants that, that, that every day. We can learn so much from our children and we have to listen to their voice. We have to listen to their voice, whether it's in an organized forum or whether it's just day to day. But that's, that's what we have to do. We should also take this model to the school. There should be councils in the schools that can present to the principal. Because you know what, guys? We're in, all in this together. And the youth of America, you know, I think our generation might have dropped the ball, but we have to rely on the youth of America to get things Thank straight you, sir. for us. Our students are probably the most amazing people in this whole room. I had the great opportunity about a month ago, I invited students from um, Alderdice, SciTech, and Carrick High School, and we all had pizza. And we sat there and we talked, and we sat there and they said, what did they like about Pittsburgh Public Schools? What did they not like about Pittsburgh Public Schools? What can I do as an adult and volunteer make it better? What can they do at their level to make their school district better? Not only for them, but for the younger students in their classes and the younger students in the little grades behind them. We need to have these voices heard. One thing that I think would be amazing is that we have our school board meetings we have these students who are willing to be here. Get them more involved in the district level. Get them involved in the school board meetings and have their voices heard, not only in their schools, but through the whole district. And let's listen to what they're saying. Thank you. I'm going to pass it on to Leon for the next question. So this question is for all candidates, and we're going to start that in again. So this is a long one, so bear with me. The research showing the benefit to child, family, and society at large of having high quality early childhood education is undeniable. We also know that getting to universal high quality early childhood education will require collaboration and partnership. What do you plan to do as a school board member to advance the vision that every child in PPS will have a high quality pre-K experience? And what barriers do you see to attaining this and how will you overcome them? That's an outstanding question. The first thing is we have to look at it logistically, okay? We have a lot of single parents. We have a lot of mixed families. So we have to be able to get the children to the program. We almost have to go back to these community schools, but also to, to almost neighborhood schools so kids can get to the school. And we have to realize that not everyone can, you know, can, can get the kids there. So we have, that, that's the big part of the problem. And we have to partner with everyone that, that can, we can get. We have to partner with Head Start. We have to partner with any type of early childhood agency that will get us on the right track. The, um, the, the like I mentioned before, the, the tough part is 
when the kids come from, they're behind, then we can't give up. Then we really have to hit the, hit the ground running in helping the, uh, helping the children. Thank you. I'm sorry, can you repeat the last part, please, of the question? Um, so, what do you plan to do as a school board member t to advance the vision that every child in PPS will have a high quality pre-K experience? Also, what barriers do you see to attaining this and how will we overcome them? Thank you. So, I think one of our biggest barriers right now is the space. We need to have the spaces for the school, for the pre-K programs, for the, for the place where they can go. And I think that that is an issue that we have. We need, there's so much need out there, and we just need to make sure we have the teachers, we have the support staff, we need the physical facilities to do this. And I think that's gonna be our biggest problem that we have. It's such a great idea. Our children need this education, and they need it. If they have it in those early three, four, five years, when they get to kindergarten, they are not, they are where they're supposed to be, and they're not behind. So we just have to figure out the best way to get it around. So there is certainly the will for early learning in this city. We saw with the recent referendum that there is the will in this city. And I believe through collaboration, Pittsburgh can be a leader in this area. One of the barriers that I believe we have is that um, Parents that are in the Head Start programs and in the um, Pre-K Counts programs, there's a fiscal cliff. So you're under a um, poverty level of, of a certain amount, but as soon as you take a job where you make enough money, then you don't get the Pre-K services for free anymore. So that, I think, is a real barrier to families because then you have to start paying for childcare, which I hear is around $1,000 a month, which is more than a college education. So we have to make sure that we collaborate, and I would be willing to say that Pittsburgh Public Schools should put more money into their pre-K programs because we know that the Pittsburgh Public School programs are high quality. You could have finished the last point. Uh, Pittsburgh Public Schools does a phenomenal job with early education. We are the largest provider of pre-K services in the city. And uh, you know we have something like 18% of meeting the need of, of income eligible children in this city compared to about 60% statewide. Um, we need to continue to expand that until we get to the point that we're universal. Uh, that's gonna involve lobbying at the state level uh, for more in the federal, for more federal spots for that funding for we have about a little over 500 more kids who, who are income eligible who don't have spots. We need to get them. Um, what those numbers don't take into account, though, is the hours in the day that those kids are spending uh, in, in pre-K and, and the quality of the, of the institutions. So uh, if a kid cannot be in school all day, then the parent cannot work a full-time job. So we do absolutely need to overcome that barrier because one of the most important elements of universal pre-K uh, is the economic benefits to working families families across the city, uh, and then uh, the quality, leveraging the mayor's new program to increase quality. Um, so I have to agree with Pam, collaboration. I probably will probably say this another like seven times this evening, because if we are not collaborating with the resources that already exist, then we are failing. And we're, and the, who we're failing as our children. And so I think if we can build the partnerships, not only just with the organizations, but this is where the city can get involved. This is where we have to reach out to the city of Pittsburgh and say, have the conversation. What is it that we need to do to make um, pre-K and early childhood education affordable and accessible to all of our families. Um, so I think this is a, it's a conversation starter, but I think that we need to uh, address it immediately and get everybody who holds stake in this, in this place involved. Um, there, there's no dispute about the importance of early childhood education. 
uh, with regard to how it uh, works within the city, this is one area where the, the district really needs to be applauded for doing a wonderful job. Most recent results of the achievement gap for uh, the achievement gap between uh, minority students and, and, and students of resources is barely barely exists, uh, and those are students who have gone through the the early pre K through the school district. So that's something that school district needs to be applauded for. There's also a number of barriers. There are not enough seats. There's insufficient funding, there's not enough certified teachers, and there's insufficient pay. And again, the district's trying to work around all those barriers. Um, with, with regard to the uh, certified teachers, the, this, their, their CTE program has added a course that's going to start next year that's going to look to address, to, to fill that need. So I, again, I would just continue to encourage and work with the city, uh, with the district, and, and, and to do this. I would say that, um, Taking students in via early pre-K is, is taking them out of whether you'd be receiving community services. So I do believe we need collaboration and funding from our community, from our, our various communities and government, local governments. So number one, I would work with uh, the local daycare centers to support uh, their staff members in aligning their curriculum to the standards. As a stay-at-home father, I remember getting the early childhood book and sitting down and developing lesson plans for my children. So you don't necessarily need to be uh, a certified uh, teacher to be able to engage with the content that they have on uh, Pennsylvania's uh, uh, education website. Number two, I think one of the things that we have to start to correct is this deficit mindset, where we're always focusing on what people don't have. As, the, as a school board member, I would work with the equity office to make sure that the early childhood education experience is culturally appropriate. Why do I say culturally appropriate and culturally responsive? Because as a father of two black boys, I constantly struggle with the educational experience of my sons in pre-K. So we talk about universal pre-K, but are we able to meet black children at their cultural needs at their academic needs and more importantly are we able to meet them at their interests and dreams because if we're not it's a waste of money it's another program that will provide more people with jobs while at the same time not serving the children of our district which the majority of the children in our district are black thank you hi audience members i see a couple of barriers to to uh universal pre-k including extended care i've coordinated extended care for uh, my own school finding a provider and it is very challenging um, also cost is a huge barrier right and we have to advocate at the state and federal level because it's going to take quite a bit of money to get to universal pre-k we have to collaborate um, with other government agencies as well as with high quality independent contractors. We've got to work together to find solutions. We know it's coming. We've got to position the district for universal pre-K. And pre-K that where we know the physical, social, emotional, and cognitive development of the children are intertwined. We've turned away from traditional play-based and socially developmentally social development in the early childhood years up through third grade. We need to return to developmentally appropriate practices through third grade because play is not a luxury, it's a necessity for young children and recess should never be taken away from young children as a punishment. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to remind the audience I appreciate all your passion and enthusiasm. But can we please hold applause to the end and also candidates please respect the time. Thank you. So next, Michelle is going to ask our final question, and then we're going to get into audience questions. Okay? This question is for all candidates. How will you support aspects of the district wellness committee, such as ensuring schools have the resources and time to offer physical activity and free play at recess? How will you support aspects of the District Wellness Committee, such as ensuring schools have the resources and time to offer physical activity and free play at recess? Oh, well, I, I think I just addressed some of that in my last question. Um, but I, I think, uh, just to reiterate what I wanted to say, is that early childhood development involves physical, social, emotional, and mental development. It goes all the way, uh, early childhood extends through eight years old. At kindergarten, we abandon developmentally appropriate practices and say now it's time for test prep, right? We need to go back to our traditional methods, which are play-based, which encourage social growth, which encourage physical exercise. There are a number of ways to do this in practical, simple, and cost-effective ways so that we can engage our early childhood 
uh, learners in developmentally appropriate practices. So when you talk about play, I think that number one, we do need to have more recess opportunities for kids. One of the things that my son always comes home and says is that I want to play. Uh, number two, I think that uh, one of the ways we can integrate more into the classroom is actually organizing uh, lesson plans where kids actually get the chance to act out things. You take, for example, uh, I volunteered at the uh, Hill District Library. So one of my fav favorite stories to read was Elephant and Pig, and we would act out the plays in the library. And you wouldn't imagine how deep of an impact that it had on these kids. These kids all of a sudden who were disengaged from reading all of a sudden wanted to read the next Elephant and Pig book, the next book. So I think that we have to be innovative in our learning approaches to integrate play in everything that we do because when we integrate play in everything that we do, kids learn at a deeper, more profound level. And just as a sidebar, MBA students uh, learn through play too. We just use an adult word called scenarios. So if an MBA, if it's good enough to integrate in the classroom for MBA students, it's good enough to integrate in the classroom for pre-K students. Thank you. If, if we believe that play is, is important for student development, and I, and I believe everyone does, again, there's not much of a dispute that, then, I mean, we just have to remember the limited role of the board. We, we can add it to the strategic plan, we can add it to the policies, but then we, we have to hold the administration accountable to making sure those things get they get implemented correctly. You know, we're not here implementing on a day-to-day -day basis. That's not our role. We're a part-time board, and, you know, and, and we're not there for day-to-day -day management. So we need to stress it, hold the administration accountable, and if the administration's not meeting our needs, we, may, we need to make the requisite changes. You know, there are young people who want to have fun and be free. I'm an adult. I want to have fun and be free, too. Sitting behind a desk, for eight hours a day is not my jam. So I work in schools and I interact with kids and I think we need to respect what our children need to be successful. That if, they're, if their role is to learn in the classroom, they need a break. They need time to play. There are kids who, when the weather isn't um, up to its best standards here in Pittsburgh, where they sit in the hallway of the school and watch TV for 30 minutes without being able to talk or move. It's unacceptable. And I think that they need a space. So we need to be able to create spaces for our young people. And I think accountability is important because it isn't our job to go in there and create a space for, for recess or playtime, but we have to make sure that we hold them accountable. We all know how important uh, play is for little kids and even older kids. We're parents. Uh, the research shows it. We know this. Absolutely, I would support a policy that would pre uh, prevent taking away things like recess as a punishment. Uh, my heart breaks when I hear stories of that, when my kid comes home and says that they didn't get to go outside because someone was talking. Uh, that's just not acceptable. Uh, I think that uh, we need to make sure that every school has sufficient space to get outside, make sure we're not paving over parts of a playground, for example, for a parking lot or something like that. And we need to make sure that there is sufficient indoor space for kids to run around and play, because um, there's lots of times when they can't go outside. We can also look at the standards for when their kids are allowed to go outside versus not because of weather. Uh, finally, I think there's a huge opportunity for our early education specialists and educators to talk with uh, younger grade teachers, kindergartner and first, third grade, to talk about how to more integrate play into the classroom, um, because that's what early education is doing great right now. So decisions that school boards make sometimes have unintended consequences. So when you make a decision to cut librarians, to cut paraprofessionals, to cut you know, all the support staff in a school, you can't have recess. So you can have your wellness policy that calls for recess, but you're not gonna have it when you don't have enough adults in the building to monitor students in the playground. So um, those are the things that I believe when we make policy, we need to look at the unintended consequences and make our policy with our values. And if we value recess, if we value playtime, our policies need to say that, and we can't change it because we don't have enough staff. We need to have the staff. 
Our children work really hard every day in school and we can't expect them to sit in a classroom for six hours at a time and not talk to anybody and not do anything. They need to be outside, they need to have their free time, they need to have their play time. That's their biggest development time. That's where they learn their social skills. They, that's where they learn how to make friends. And that is such an important part in their life and we can't get rid of that. And I agree with you, we can't have all these children out on the playground if we don't have the staff to do it. We need to make sure that we have the support staff in the buildings to make sure that our students and our children are getting their free time and their play time. And one thing we have got to make sure of is that we cannot use the one thing that they want the most that gives them that break and use it as a punishment. Because someone was talking, we can't do that. We can't take the recess away from them, their play time away from them and expect them to sit there. When you look at it, we think playtime. You know, we think it's disorganized, kids running around or whatever. But playtime is a tremendous learning experience for children. It's where children learn how to get along. It's where the adults are not interfering. Oh, Tommy, don't do that, you know, or don't pick on my, the kids can work it out. One of the biggest problems now you see in athletics, kids are playing organized sports, four years old, t-ball, where when, you know, in the old days, you'd go out and the kids would pick teams. You throw a kid a bat, boom, 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 they grab the top, he got first pick, you got first pick, I get the next two. Kids work stuff out, and that's very important, and that's a building block of the social, social, socialization that can help kids be successful in school. They learn to help somebody out. They learn to ask for help. They learn to extend their hand. They learn to work out problems without the interference of adults. Thank you. Now we'll have Dom asking an audience question. Okay, so with that, we're going to start our uh, questions that were provided by the audience. Um, each one is going to have one minute for every candidate, so they're all for each candidate. Uh, so, oh, okay, my bad. Thank you. Um, so the first audience question is, um, the Pittsburgh Public Schools annual budget is $650 million. What is your experience with and approach to managing multi-million dollar budgets? Oh, yeah. So what is your approach to and experience with uh, managing multi-million dollar budgets? Anyone can start. <laughs> One minute each. I have no experience managing multi-million dollar budgets. Um, I will tell you, um, I, th I think one of the things I see is I, I work in information technology for a large research university over there in Oakland. And we have tens of thousands of users, and we have uh, multi-million dollar, we have million, million dollar budgets, but not multi-million dollar budgets. Um, and I think the importance of oversight is incredibly important when doing a budget. It's important to have controls so that you have multiple um, players overseeing and auditing the budgets. It's important to evaluate them closely on a line item basis. And um, just, I'll just finish up by saying, I think the controls and external audits are the most important thing so that you can identify weaknesses in the budget and places where you can create efficiencies or perhaps address issues that you didn't see were there. Thank you. So I don't have any experience uh, managing a million dollar budget, but I do have an experience as a former trustee at Lincoln University. When I was elected student body president, I was also uh, elected uh, trustees. So the university had million dollar decisions that we had to make. That's number one. Number two, one of my key things is not necessarily be the financial person because I would love to engage in dialogue with the financial office to figure out how we allocate our resources. And so that's the types of questions that I would ask. How are we allocating our resources? Why do we allocate them? Is, are there ways in which we can maximize our resources to uh, enable students to uh, maximize their academic potential. Well, I'm the treasurer of a 25,000 annual uh, year uh, food kitchen, but, uh, but in my professional life I, and in my education as well, I, I've had uh, training, uh, significant training looking at financial statements, specifically for middle market and investment grade companies, and those are companies with you know, 500 million to, you know, billions of dollars in revenue. 
Uh, I, I currently uh, am a lawyer doing commercial lending, uh, working predominantly again with middle market and investment grade companies. I, I've, my function is primarily legal, but in that capacity, I, I, I do, and, and the review of financials is typically a credit function, but they're pretty intertwined. And so I, I can say over the years, I spent a number of, I mean, a lot of time having reviewed financial statements, and I can find my way around them pretty comfortably. Never have I managed that much money in my life. But I worked at the University of Pittsburgh for 10 years and learned how to budget like a boss on a one month paycheck. Um, and I think that that's really important is one of my, sh my skill sets um, is what I don't know or I'm not most familiar with. I make the opportunity to educate myself and have the conversations that I need to have with people who do have those experiences and, and learn and grow and make decisions that are uh, beneficial to everybody around me because this is a volunteer role that I am here to serve you all. And so what I don't know, I make sure that um, I make up for in educating myself and being informed so I can make the best decisions possible. Uh, so I, I mentioned that I work professionally uh, with public sector agencies right now. I manage project budgets um, that are often million dollar annual budgets uh, for our direct projects. Uh, and uh, I work with the decision making that goes into these large transportation agency, multi-million, multi-billion dollar budgets. Um, how, are they, how are they choosing their investments? Uh, what criteria are they using to look at? If we put money here doing this, what's gonna be our outcomes on our goals, our performance measures? Um, and that is one of the regular things that I do in my uh, for, for a living. Um, that I think is very relevant. You have to be digging into budgets and asking questions. And one of the things you really have to look out for is the power and the danger of uh, what we did before, of just tradition, history. You have to always ask, why are we spending this money here and is it doing its job? Uh, so I definitely would want to uh, make sure that the board would get the budget with sufficient time to look carefully at those things. So I have 12 years of experience watching Pittsburgh Public School Board meetings and reading the budgets. I've read every budget. I've spoken at public hearings about the budget. Um, one thing that is interesting to note is that the Pittsburgh Public School Board gets seated in December, and that same month they vote on a $650 million budget. So that's not the time to learn about the budget. One thing that I have also noticed is that City Council has a completely different budgeting process and every um, department has to come and defend their budget and we don't do that in Pittsburgh Public Schools. We get the full big giant budget and every department person um, put their stuff in and Pittsburgh Public School board members don't get to speak to those people and I think that's something that should change. Well, unfortunately, I don't have experience with a multi-million dollar budget. I wish, um, but I don't. But I think what we need to do is go back to the common sense. A budget is a budget is a budget. If this is what you have to work in, then this is what you have to work with. And make sure that you don't overspend and you utilize every dollar that you have. And make sure that we utilize our resources. We have board advisors and find the specialists in each area that we're uncertain about to give us the best advice and to figure out how we need to do it and what we need to do. Well, I do have uh, six years' experience with a multi million dollar company budgeting. I used, before I was teaching, I used to work for Kmart Corporation. I was a merchandise manager of a multi-million dollar store. I was in charge of purchasing, scheduling, uh, making sure the bottom line was correct, worked at the proper pro uh, profit margin. Also, when I was a head football coach at Perry, we had a top 10 program in the state for 15 years on a $3,240 budget. Butler High School spends that on balls. Okay, so you have to have hawkish oversight. It's, there's, there's stuff going on now, we, I was talking earlier about the board tabs. They're, they're sticking budget stuff in without even meeting on it. 
and that cannot happen. That cannot happen. We have to hold them fiscally responsible. Okay. Well, I can talk a lot. We, do I get a couple more seconds? Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. The, uh, the, the curriculum that we bought for uh, uh, first grade to third grade was the fourth on the bottom. This one. Somebody on. snuck it in. Thank you. Somebody snuck it in. It wasn't even originally there. Somebody snuck in a curriculum that's not meeting the needs. That's what we have to watch for. We can't have this happen. Also, we talk about the preschool teachers. Why are they paid less than regular teachers? Thank you. I'll pass it on to Leon for the next question. So we'll let you guys just share on one mic. And we're going to start with Mr. Griffin L over here for the next question. So, this is an audience question. With the rise in uh, school shootings um, and the uh, emphasis on school safety, what is your viewpoint on the proposal brought by school police officers to allow them to carry firearms uh, inside school buildings? Well, I'll start there. I, 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 I'm completely opposed to it. I, I'm, I'm, I'm concerned about the, the fact that it makes it a police state. We already have a number of systemic factors that have uh, that has led to disproportionate uh, treatment and suspensions and expulsions, um, particularly with our, our African American population. So I, I would it, I, I would not be at all in in in, in favor of promoting that. I, I think the research shows that it, you know it, it, it leads to increased bullying and other uh, other other negative uh, attributes as well. So I, I would not look to promote anything along those lines. So number one, I totally disagree with uh, arming officers in school. This is a key issue on why I believe that students should be voting board members. Students should be able to vote on who can carry guns inside of their school. When we say we believe in student voice, what we're saying is that we're, we're willing to listen to them and work for them versus saying that students should be voting board members who we work with to develop policies that meet their needs in particular as it relates to this. I would also say the way in which we keep our schools safe is by developing a culture of empathy from student to parent to teacher to educational leader. That is the way in which we decrease school violence yeah, I'll stop there. I'll yield my time. Um, no, we don't need to be carrying guns in schools. I feel like it's a, it's a downward <laughs> slope. If we allow it to happen, then um, so many other issues will come about. What I do think that we need to make sure is that we are utilizing the resources that we do have in um, having counselors and therapists or um, community organizations and groups that provide mentorship for the students, um, really tapping into our restorative justice practices and utilizing them not just as conflict resolution, but as community building so that inside the school that we create a culture um, where we can sit down and have a conversation about the issues instead of fighting or arguing. Um, and I do believe that our students need to be safe um, 100%. And so I think utilizing the security guards that we do have is important. Thank you. Next to you. Uh, yeah, he's going last. Don't okay. Uh, no guns. No guns in schools. More guns don't result in less violence. We know that. We don't want guns in our schools. Uh, overall, leaving guns aside and out of it, out of our schools where they belong, or out of, I don't know, they belong anywhere. But security in general and keeping our schools safe is such a emotional and conflicting topic for me as a parent and I think for a lot of people out there. I hate that I have to think about sending my kid to school and, and dealing with these issues. I hate it and I don't want my schools to feel like a prison. And I don't want us to be implementing policies and, and, and uh, rolling out uh, endeavors just to make us feel better uh, and make us think we're safer when it's not doing anything. So for every security measure, I want to look 
at what is the problem we're trying to solve? Is there a problem in actuality? Is what we're doing going to solve it? Are those metal detectors going to keep my kids safer? If yes, I want them there. And if no, then we don't need them. I agree with Devin on this one. We need counselors. We need social workers. We need peacemakers. We need mediators. We need to learn conflict resolution skills that we would be able to learn if we had recess. Um, our schools need to be safe and they need to be supportive, but there are proactive measures that we can use to do that. Unfortunately, we have at our state level legislators that want to continue to harden our schools. Police in schools show, when the research shows that when there are police in schools, the rates of arrest go up for black, brown, and disabled students. We don't need police in schools. Security, fine but police have the ability to make an arrest. They are walking through the halls of our schools looking for criminals. We don't need police and we don't need guns. I am not in favor of our school security being armed. And with that being said, when I met with my group of teenagers, one of the questions we asked were, do you feel safe in your school? And there were seven, teenagers there and every single one of them said yes I do most definitely school guards should not be armed but again, uh -oh. our schools should be a safe haven we should be welcoming we want to stop this school to prison pipeline we have the more arrests that happen when there's, when there's policemen in the building because, as Ms. Harbin said, that's their job for no reason at all. I've seen it. I've never been afraid one day in 27 years in a school, and I can go back to when there were the neighborhood rivalries. Kids come to the school to be safe, to be loved, and to be taught. And the, the biggest mistake is this militarization of the police. When they come in and you know, they want, they want to run the show. It's our show. We're the teachers in the building. We're, we know these kids. And th these kids have to have a good plan from grades one through 12 to be successful. If a kid is incarcerated or is out of school, their whole life is thrown off by years. And we can't let this happen. I do not believe that the officers should be armed. I do believe that safety is the number one top priority in our schools. Our students can't learn if they're not safe. Um, I would also say that we have to, we live in a dangerous world, right? There are a lot of threats outside our schools. We have to assess the physical threats and deploy tools based on site-by-site -site analysis to make sure that our students are safe. But safety isn't just physical safety, it's also psychological safety. We need to create a safe and welcoming space for all kinds of students, no matter what they look like, where they were born, what religion they practice, or if they are LGBT or Q. Uh, I've, I work closely with Pittsburgh Zone 5 Police, and I work as a Highland Park Community Council member, and we've seen the transition to community policing, as well as the training on implicit bias, and I believe that implicit bias training is something we should consider um, looking at on more, uh, at some level to um, train against implicit bias. Thank you. And Michelle will ask the next audience question. Okay, so for this question, we're gonna start with um, Nasikari. Oh, <laughs> okay, we're gonna start with you. Um, how would you advocate, and this question is for all of you, how would you advocate against racism in the school district? So I think that this is a big topic. I think the one way that you advocate against racism isn't by merely having confrontations. I think we need to have dialogues. I give you a perfect example. When my son's preschool was grappling with implicit bias, I went to the teacher, had multiple conversations, my wife and I, went to the, the school director, had multiple conversations with her, and then I worked with the school to develop a program to meet the children at their needs. So I think that we can have conversations, we can have confrontations, because at this point, 
I'm in a confrontation mode and the school hasn't moved with deliberate speed. This isn't a PPS school, just, just for, uh, you know, yeah, whatever. But I had to force this school to move with deliberate speed because they're not meeting my child at his needs, nor are they educating children to be what I call citizens in a solid bowl, which means that everybody is appreciated in this solid bowl we call America, very specifically Pittsburgh. So that's one way I would advocate dialogue, conversation, in some cases confrontation, and policy making. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, recognizing the limited role of the board, again, I think at, at a minimum, we need to set a good example amongst ourselves. So let's start there. Um, but then again, also recognizing the limited role of the board, I, you know, I, would, I personally would pledge never to support any policy that discriminates on any level. I would work with the other board members to eliminate any type of discrimination, even if it's implicit uh, and indirect. And I would also try to work with the administration and promote policies that look to normalize behaviors because as you familiarize people with certain, uh, certain behaviors, patterns, and the like, it, it tends to lessen the discriminatory action. You can make a policy, but if it's not implemented, it means nothing. So I think when I think about the students that I work with directly in my mentoring program, um, they have so much to offer. And I think if our teachers and our administrators and our service providers and the community members and the families are not educated and have the conversation and feel comfortable enough to have the conversation about implicit bias, this is a problem. This is also where I think the diversity in the teaching staff. You know, kids respond differently to me as a black woman than they do than to their white teachers. And that's, that's just reality. You know, I can have the same conversation and they say, all right, Miss Devin, I'm cool. Like, I'll chill out. And I think that this is important to understand that we as adults have to make sure that we implement these things on the school level. Absolutely, we need, we need a more diverse teaching force to start with. We need to absolutely uh, get more people of color, more people with diverse background, more LGBTQ teachers in our classrooms. Um, we need to make sure that we are talking about this with our teachers and professional development and not just a one and done, we did culturally relevant, relevant training once two years ago and now we're good. We need to make sure that there's follow through, that there's follow up, that teachers are supported and coached. And we need to have some difficult conversations in the schools among teachers. We need to have it among students. We need to have it among parents and in our communities. Pittsburgh is one of the most racially segregated cities in the country. We need to be talking about that. We need to talk about the fact that the schools in Squirrel Hill are so different from the schools across town in Homewood, not even across town, right over the, 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 the Penn Avenue. Um, we need to get a little bit uncomfortable and we need to be okay with that. And we need to make sure that every time, like Devin said, we're passing a policy that we mean it and we are implementing it with follow through. The education system is built on institutional racism and white supremacy. The 53% of our students are black, but the policies that we have in our school district are made for white students. When you are a black student and you have to decide between taking African American history or AP English, that's not okay. Um, when you have 84% white teachers in your district, that's not okay. I need to tell you that we need to listen to our students, but we also need to listen to, there's two women in this room that I know, there might be more, but the um, advocates for African American students have been saying this stuff for 30 years, it's time to listen to the community. I think the first thing we need to do is to make sure that we as the adults and the educators and the school board members and everybody in the community set a good example for all the students and all the teach or for all the students. We need to make sure that you are correct. We need a more diverse teaching staff. If you see it, you live it, you learn it, and you see it, and it doesn't make a difference. So I think that what should be one of our main priorities is to have a better and more diverse teaching staff and show the children that it doesn't matter and that will help 
these children learn that racism is, needs to not be an important part of their life, that you're going to school to learn. Am I on? Thank you. Now, this is a very, very tough question. We have to sit down and be honest on racism. Everybody wants to dance around it. Everybody wants to, you know, say the right thing, but we have to meet it head on. I was uh, privileged to teach on the North Side for 20 years, had a tremendous rapport with the neighborhood, and I just, I just want to read something that I, I received the other day from one of my old players. Gee, you are a father figure to all of us. One of the best men I have ever been around. That's from a successful African-American male right now, an entrepreneur. We can do it. We can do it. I just saw my principal, Ms. Sacco, we came in. We were on the phone recruiting a young African-American male to be a teacher. It has to be done. It has to be done, and we are charged with that. Uh, speaking on the personal level, I understand that I have to educate myself about the needs of African American students and other students of color in the district. And I can do this by listening and learning to black parents, to black students, and to students of other races. Um, I have an interracial marriage, so I've had to learn a lot about um, raising children, you know, for who are mixed race, right? And it's not quite the experience I had in rural Texas, right? For a mixed race kid in an urban environment. Um, as a board member, I think the important thing is to value inclusion and to make it an asset. In our global workforce, we need people who can work with a variety of people from a variety of backgrounds. And so we can use this to our advantage and make it something that separates PPS and makes us more very valuable. I'd also like to see more underrepresented groups in STEM fields, meaning more women, African American students, and Latino students going into science, technology, engineering, and math. I teach at a cybersecurity camp each summer, and there's no diversity there. Thank you. Just a quick reminder please hold all uh, applause to the end. Um, this, this next question is um, I want to start with William. Gallagher, um, and this is for all candidates. Um, how do you plan to include parents and slash families more into their child's, child's education? Parental engagement has been proven to be the most important underlying factor in educating a child. We have many things in place that we do not utilize. We have curriculum that has portals that the parents can get on their phone and check their child's process and see what their homework is to help them, nobody knows about it. Someone dropped the ball. Someone in the curriculum department dropped the ball. The teachers don't know about it, so it's not used. We have to have an open door. At Perry Traditional Academy when I was there, our door was wide open. Our football practices were wide open. In the summer when we ran our strength and conditioning program, we had father. We involve the whole family. And that's another thing about the athletics department. Our kids play football games at 3 o'clock in the afternoon and the parents can't go to them. Why is this? Why is this? It should not happen. We fought that for years. We only play you know, two, two nights a week. It should be, they should all be night games. But it's, we have to get the parents involved. I think this is a really good example of community schools. Getting our parents involved in the community, in the schools, not only bringing the parents to the school to talk about the grades and the child, but to give the parents what they need and make sure that they have everything that they need. And once they're there, make sure that they're educated on their child and the school and the community. And I think that's the best way to get our parents involved is going to start with the community schools. I definitely agree with the community schools model, but if you don't have somebody that is um, tasked to engage parents, we used to have parent engagement specialists in the district, they're all gone. I would say we need somebody who is a parent engagement specialist, who is a community organizer, who has the ability to build relationships 
because that is one of the things that makes parents feel comfortable. And also, sometimes the big idea comes from really small things. And when the teachers first reach out to parents um, for the first communication of the year, it's, it's better in elementary grades, but as you get to high school, you get the five-page list of all the things your kid can get suspended for. I would say, make that first communication, how do I reach you? Email, phone number, and then build a relationship. We, we need to be able to build relationships with each other. I think good communication is really key to this. I think uh, the way a school communicates says a lot about how well it functions and whether parents feel like it's functioning. If they can get in touch with the principal when they need to and actually go in and see the principal, if they know who to contact for different issues, if they even know what's going on at the school at various times, communication is huge. And I think that at the district level, we should absolutely be encouraging every single school to have uh, full communication, have best practices, because that's how you're going to engage your parents. Um, I love some of the things that I've seen recently in our schools you know I've, we've got the apps now where I can actually message teachers and I, I hear back from them within an hour and that's amazing and wonderful um, encouraging Kim continuing with that and you know this is where we have to start thinking um, about the fact that not every parent and family has access to the same uh, things that the rest of us do we have to think about uh, families who do not speak English and don't have access to the internet in our communications with them Um, I think the district does a really good job at engaging parents, but it's not the right parents always. Um, I think if we're able to meet um, all parents where they're at. So we talked a lot about um, sports, right? And I know that there are parents that show up to see their baby play football every Saturday or Sunday morning and then to be there all day and help behind the concession stand and make sure that the kids eat after the games. So they're engaged, but I think how we're engaging our parents is what we need to take a look at and assess. Um, I also think that we have to make sure that if our children are engaged with their teachers and their administrators, that the parents will be engaged. If a, good, if a child has a good relationship with their teacher or with the administrators in the building, then they're gonna talk about that at home and it's gonna make the parent want to know what's going on inside the classroom. The, the question recognizes that parents are fundamental to, to outcomes and education outcomes. Uh, I mean, individually, I, I, I need to engage with a lot more parents to figure this out, but what comes to mind, and, and, and I'll probably repeat well, what, what's been said, community schools and, and enhancing, improving the, the community school model, um, recognizing barriers and eliminating barriers uh, that exist for, for, for engagement, and, and I'd also like to make, see schools and the administration to make them a lot more welcoming than what currently exists. So, number one, I think that we have to recognize one key thing, that parents have gone, have gone through the same educational system that didn't meet them at their academic need nor prepared them for their dreams. That's number one. How I engage parents in the libraries throughout the city was number one, walking up to them and saying, hey, what does your child want to be? And parents all of a sudden light up. I said, before I ask you that, what do you want to be when you grow up? And we start laughing. And then I say, what is your child's interest? What are their strengths? What are their superpowers? What, how do we leverage their interests to make them more engaged in reading in particular, but academics in general? And you wouldn't imagine how much information I got from parents who didn't know me from a can of paint other than having a Reading Buddies uh, uh, logo on my shirt. So we have to see parents as partners that we work with, not that we work for, and we have to move away from seeing parents as people with deficits. We have to see them with agency, even if they can't read. They're still human beings who have the possibility to engage their children and to develop those competencies as their life progresses. Thank you. So parental, parental engagement 
is, is something that I think is really important for our students, as most of us do. We've got to provide the tools. We've got to truly value parental engagement. There are a variety of tools that we've discussed. Uh, one example is I know a school district that provides parent, uh, parent math curriculum tools on their website, right? So they bought the curriculum that had the parent component that they can deploy on their website, which makes it easier for parents to get engaged in math. Um, and then in terms of face coordinators in the school, we have uh, face coordinators who could play a valuable part in that. We need to find good people, invest in them, and make sure that we truly value that parental engagement. I'm going to pass it on to Liam to ask more audience questions. So that actually was our final audience question that we're going to ask for tonight. We're going to do one more final question for our candidates, and then um, you're going to have time to speak with them afterwards. We want to hear from the executive director of Apple Schools, Mr. James Fogarty, and then you can have time to speak with the candidates. So we're going to start with Ms. Batista over there. And um, this question is, so this is your um, opportunity to let people know why they should vote for you. So basically, just just feel why they should vote for you and what can you bring to um, students and uh, future students? Sure. Uh, I, I think that people should vote for me to be on the school board because I have a policy level view of the way our community is working and what we can do and how we can do it to see real change at a system level. Our school district is a system. It's a system of individuals and schools and it's a complex system. If you want to see change at that level, you need to be asking a lot of questions and looking at a lot of information. You need to be holding people accountable and you need to know who you're holding accountable, what you're asking them to do, what you're looking at, and what that information is telling you about what's going on at your system. Because at the end of the day, at the other end of that system are the people, are the students who are dealing with it every day, are the families who are interacting with it every day. And we want everything to work for them. We want them to feel like the system is responding to them, that it's not some big faceless thing. I want to bring my expertise, I want to bring my passion for my community and my progressive values to uh, the school district. So for the last 12 years, I've been working to improve Pittsburgh public schools and protect public education. I've been working with many, many people in this room as an advocate and a community organizer. I have built positive relationships um, where I can collaborate across the state and the city. Um, but the most important thing is that I have built relationships with parents and teachers and students. And I listen to the parents and the teachers and the students. Um, I believe that the policy that we make up here has to come from down there, and I will hold to that. And I will make sure that students have a voice. I will make sure, uh, or I will continue to have parents call me any hour of the day with any questions that they have. Um, I will continue to advocate for individual families in crisis, and I will make sure that we all can have the schools that our children deserve. I believe in our district. I believe in our teachers, I believe in our students, and I believe I can make a difference if I'm elected. I have the passion, I have the desire. I think we have such a great school board and I think we have such a great district and our kids and our students deserve so much. And I think given the chance, I can make sure that everybody has been giving, everybody who graduates can feel like they have gotten the best and the most out of Pittsburgh Public Schools that they deserved. Well, I've had 27 years training for this job. I know the teachers, I know the administrators, I know the union, I know central administration. I have relationships throughout the city, not just in our district. I've basically worked in almost every school in 27 years. I understand how things operate. I've seen the successes, I've seen the failures. I've seen the fiasco when we brought in a Broad University superintendent that tried to destroy our schools. I've seen Shenley destroyed, and right now, if you go to the north side, Perry's down to 400 students. They're trying to destroy that school. They're talking about cutting teachers next year. I am an advocate for the children. 
I am an advocate for the parents, and I am an advocate for our community. Uh, Kevin Gorman from the Tribune Review, he called me a Brookline lifer. I moved two, two blocks away from my parents' home. I know the community, and I'm excited, and I'm passionate about what our schools can become. If you know nothing else about me, know this. My son is in the PPS All City Junior Band. So when the band director needed a French horn player, I stepped up and I am now the 2019 PPS All City Junior Band first chair French horn. Okay. Thank you. But seriously, I want our schools to be a safe and welcoming place for students, regardless of what they look like, what religion they practice, where they were born, or if they are LGBT or Q. I promise to listen, to learn, and to approach issues with an open mind as your school board representative. So please vote for me on May 21st, and if you don't, I am still first chair of French Horn. Thank you. Good evening. The, um, the district has under its auspices 22,000 students, uh, a, a general second, fund budget of 650 one second, million. One second, one second. Are you answering? Okay. Yeah. So the reason why you should vote for me is because I gave life service, not just lip service. When I was in South Africa, I stood up for the right for people to vote, uh, the right for people to work, and lost my right to vote, wrote, lost my right to work. I am an advocate. I have put my life on the line for things that I believe in. I got into the field of education and did a PhD because I wanted to figure out ways in which to create solutions to our pressing educational problems. So voting for me is voting for a revolutionary. As that old song from the 80s said, I'm talking about a revolution. What I'm talking about is changing the structures. Martin Luther King said, an edifice that produces beggars needs to be restructured or reformed or transformed. What I'm saying is that our educational system has failed too many kids. We need to transform it, and I am the transformative agent to do so. I would appreciate your vote, and I would appreciate your dialogue moving forward. Thank you. As I was saying, the board or the district has under its auspices 22,000 students, 55 buildings, a general fund budget of 650 million, 4,000 employees. Um, I mean, there are significant regulatory, contractual, financial constraints that are impacting the district's ability to achieve our goals of improving learning outcomes. My contention and my reason for running is that I strongly believe that my uh, background in law and public policy, my uh, education, my experience, uh, my track record of being able to work on complex part problems in large organizations makes me the most suitable candidate for the district to uh, position to address this. On an aside, I just don't want people to think I'm an all corporate. I was in the Peace Corps. I had a, a, a young brother, a little brother from Homewood for six years. I serve in a nonprofit right now with affordable housing. I'm in, involved in some pro bono activities for uh, LGBT, transgender, and criminal expungement. I mean, I have a dedicated, consistent background of his, you know, like commitment to the community as well that I bring to this. Failed education system. You're absolutely right. That is what. Our students deserve better from us. We are all responsible for their success. If you haven't done your part, then you are a part of the problem. I'm a part of the problem, but I'm here to be the solution. And I think um, our students deserve representatives who are gonna listen to them who are gonna advocate for them, and who are gonna make decisions based on what they need and what they deserve. I think accountability is important. Integrity is important. These are characteristics that I believe in, that my you know, years of AmeriCorps service, that my time serving in nonprofit and working in mentorship programs to make sure that these kids are successful is why I'm your choice for May 21st, so. So thank you to all the candidates. And now I'm gonna bring up our executive director of A Plus Schools, Mr. James Fogarty. Can we give a big round of applause? This is the time where you finally get to give a big round of applause for all these candidates. Thank you all. 
for the, for the current school board members, for the candidates that are running, this is one of the hardest jobs we have in our community. Um, it is unpaid, it is unthanked. Um, so tonight I just wanna make sure you feel thanked, that you feel loved, uh, because we need you to do this hard work. Um, the second thing I wanna do is thank these amazing students. Leon, Michelle, Dominic, thank you. I don't think any adult in this room could have kept this strong group of people um, on task and on time. So I thank you uh, for, for your, your role tonight and for helping us out. Um, so there's a couple bits of uh, housekeeping. I wanted to let you know about a candidate forum uh, that's coming up uh, that is being co-hosted by many of the same organizations that co-hosted tonight's event, uh, including BPEP, League of Women Voters, Pump, Bend the Arc, Urban League, uh, what am I looking at, the NAACP, uh, the, the Western PA Black Political Assembly, I didn't wanna leave anyone out. Um, City Council District 6 and si District 7 and 9 Tuesday, April 30th from 6 to 8 p.m. at the Homewood Community Engagement Center. It's that new beautiful community engagement center in Homewood at 622 North Homewood Avenue. Uh, if you are interested in those two council district races, please go check it out. Um, you know, the, these, all of these elections are important. I mean, but what are we trying to get you, you and the rest of us to do? Vote school board first. Can I have you say it one time with me? Vote school board first. Um, we will have volunteers with clipboards out. If you're interested in helping us get information to candidates at the poll, nonpartisan information that helps people learn more about the candidates that are running, um, please sign up on the clipboard, join us on election day, and let's make sure every person who shows up to the ballots that day votes for school board and votes school board first. Thank you all, thank you candidates, uh, and thank you to the community for being so involved. Good night. <laughs>